Hello, my name is Ian Howard. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Restored Church. Uh, if you've been attending with us for a while, or if you're brand new, we'll fill you in on where we're at. We are working our way through the book of Acts in the New Testament. And today we are starting a brand new series entitled Characters, which I am super excited about. Um, I have a two-year-old son, Bennett, and he enjoys playing with blocks and Legos and cars and balls and things of that nature. But he hasn't really figured out the whole dress-up thing. Well, that was my jam as uh, as a youngster. Uh, I just recently turned 33, so probably about 30 years ago. I loved playing dress-up. Uh, I have a little sister, and she and I would always uh, dress up in costume and play together, and we always loved being different characters. Even to this day, I love doing impressions of people because uh, I think there's something fascinating and something that we can learn from other people. And so... Uh, I'm excited to dive into this series of characters and see what we see in the book of Acts, what we can learn from these people, and uh, and what God has for us. So let's get started. Uh, originally on the schedule, I was slated to speak on Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And I approached Aaron and I said, Aaron, I don't really want to lead off with Stephen on the first Sunday of 2021 after the year that was 2020 pandemic and what have you, um, you know, can we start on a, on a brighter note? He said, yeah, sure. Fine. Pick whatever you want. So I twisted his arm and I actually, uh, today we're going to be talking about Philip, uh, who actually is, is near and dear to my heart. I grew up in the Salvation Army, uh, which is a worldwide evangelical, uh, mission, uh, they, they spread the gospel, they care for people, they are on sites of disasters, um, they uh, are evangelistic and missional in nature, and so I'm wired that way. Um, my grandparents were pastors in the Salvation Army, and even just talking with my grandfather a few weeks ago, uh, he was talking about um, winning souls for Christ and saving saving souls. And so that's the mission of the army. And that's what they want to do is they want to, they want to evangelize. They want to, they want to tell people the good news about Jesus. And so, um, that's how I'm wired. That's how I was brought up. And so, uh, I'm really excited to talk about Philip, the real first true evangelist. That being said, uh, me being, um, kind of a, a, a nerd liking to dig into words and what they mean and definitions and origins and things of that nature. I looked up the definition of evangelist and the definition, uh, the first definition you find is someone who tries to convert uh, someone to their faith or religion, particularly Christianity. And so we get a lot of the, uh, you know, evangelical Christians or ev TV evangelists. So we get the, when we hear the term evangelical or evangelist, those are kind of the things that we think of. Um, but I dug a little bit deeper and I found a definition that I absolutely love. Um, and it just is a couple words that we're all familiar with, but I feel like explains it so well. An evangelist is someone who is a zealous advocate for something. Um, so I feel like that describes me perfectly. I am a zealous advocate for Detroit, for the state of Michigan. Um, specifically Detroit style pizza. I know of three or four places here in the DC area. So if you're hankering for a good slice of Detroit style pizza, I'm your dude. Uh, I don't know people. I can't be like, Hey, tell them my name. Like people just look at you crazy, but I can get you the restaurants and where to go. Little Caesars is probably the easiest for those of you that don't know your fun fact of the day. Little Caesars is Detroit style pizza and is a little taste of home for me. Anyways, more zealous advocacy. I'm a zealous advocate of all of Justin Timberlake's albums because he is, in fact, the greatest artist of our generation. And uh, that I will fight to the death on. Anyways, I'm also a zealous advocate for teenagers because I think that they're misunderstood and underappreciated. I'm a zealous advocate for Jesus Christ and his ways uh, because I think he is just the best. And uh, I believe he shows us a better way to live than our own and that he offers us something bigger and better to be a part of. So Philip happened to also be a zealous advocate for Jesus and he knew and believed in Jesus and he knew that his ways were the best and that Jesus was who he said he was in being the son of God. And so the first time we see Philip come onto the scene, all great characters have an origin story. Um, 
I think in comic books and movies, you know, we love hearing about how these characters got started. And so, you know, I'm not going to go into Philip's birth and where he's from, etc. cetera. Um, but we first see Philip on the scene uh, as one of the seven men appointed to care for a group of Hellenist widows that were being overlooked in Jerusalem. Now, Hellenists were, in this case, a Greek-speaking Jew uh, who was also aware of the Greek culture, literature, art, etc. Philip, along with Stephen, whom I mentioned as the first martyr, we'll talk about him another day, but those two uh, were Hellenists as well, and they were able to speak the language, they were able to identify and relate with the culture, and so when this need arose within the church, which, as we know, the church's biggest uh, impact early on was caring for orphans, widows, poor, neglected, marginalized people, that was where the church thrived. And so uh, when this specific instance popped up, uh, the group of 12 original disciples got together and they nominated seven people to handle this situation so that they could continue doing other work. And Philip is one of these people that was nominated because he was also Greek speaking. He could uh, identify and um, come alongside these people in their need. Now, Personally, I can't help but wonder if Peter, John, and the other apostles saw something in these men, specifically Philip, that showed maybe an inclination or a gifting towards zealous advocacy, towards evangelism. Maybe they saw giftings in each of them to connect with and care for other people. Maybe these seven were suckers for the underdog, or the marginalized, or the overlooked, and that's what qualified them or gifted them to work with these Hellenistic widows. Philip was a zealous advocate for the good news, and through Philip, the Great Commission was fulfilled. Earlier in Acts, uh, in Jesus' ascension, we see Jesus tell people, you will spread my word, you will spread the good news about me to Jerusalem, to Samaria, Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. And so when Jesus says that, that kind of represents a small bubble, a medium bubble, and a bigger bubble to the ends of the earth, the biggest possible bubble. So Philip, through Philip's appointment, this is carried out as he takes... Um, the good news to Samaria. Now, for those of you that may know, or for those of you that may not know, uh, Jews did not really like Samari Samaritans all that well. They were not pure Jews. Uh, racially, they were a half Jew, half Gentile people who were didn't really have a home. They were disliked by the Jews and they were disliked by the non-Jews. And so they didn't really have any any allies, but they did believe in the Hebrew God. And they were anticipating a Messiah, much like the Jews. Uh, they did maintain their Jewish heritage, but were not considered Jews uh, by the Jews from Judah. So that being said, Philip listens to the Spirit. The Spirit calls him down, and their identity didn't matter to Philip. Philip listened to the Spirit, and you know he, he was able to, his own humanness, he overlooked their race, their gender, where they were from. It didn't matter. Philip listened to the Spirit. He was in step. Uh, he believed so strongly in the good news and the teachings of Christ that he became a zealous advocate for the gospel of Jesus. And he threw out all the preconceived notions and culturally preset attitudes towards Samaritans, and he obeyed the Spirit. Now, this is where I will do my Jim Gaffigan impression. Those of you that have watched Jim, Jim Gaffigan, he loves doing his stand-up, and then he'll do the like the, the third-person point of view. When's he going to stop talking about dentists? This is where I step aside and say, when's he going to start reading Scripture? He hasn't read, read any Scripture yet. The Scripture is here. We got it. Uh, Acts 8, 4 through 8. So Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed them, proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And then verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. Two things stick out to me about these verses. First, there was healing and restoration. This tells me that there was forgiveness of sins or repentance. In the scriptures, in the Bible, illness or unwellness, again, in those days, uh, was an indication of sin in a person's life. We talked in a previous uh, message about Acts when we were talking about Peter and John going to the temple and encountering the, the crippled beggar at the gate of the temple. 
Peter had had an experience before where he asked Jesus, was it, was it his parents' sin or was it his sin that caused him to be like this? So in the minds of a first century Jew, anybody that was sick or unwell or, uh, you know, handicapped, crippled, it was their fault due to their sin. And so when we see healing that shows forgiveness of sins, it shows me specifically in this case, when Philip was present, when Christians are present, present, there should be healing, there should be forgiveness, there should be res restoration, and there should be repentance or, or turning up and changing of ways. The second thing that sticks out to me about this passage is the entire eight words of verse eight. So there was much joy in that city. This made me ask the question to myself, is there joy where I am? Am I bringing joy, happiness, healing, forgiveness, and grace to every room, uh, call, uh, hangout, whatever? Anywhere I go, am I bringing joy? Am I making that place better by my presence, by the Spirit's presence within me? Uh, I used to attend a church in, in Columbus, Ohio, and the pastor there, a good friend of mine, used to always say, wherever Christians are, the world should be a better place. And I think Philip is an incredible example of that. And by listening to the Spirit, going and teaching and preaching and healing, he makes that place, he makes Samaria a better place simply because of his presence. And I think that's the way it should be for all of us Christians. So something to think about moving forward. We jump to verse 26 and we see Philip's next and most famous move. And I'll go ahead and read that for us. Again, this is uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opens, his not, opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you? Does the prophet say this? Is it about himself or about somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with his with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. The eunuch and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Astosis, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Again, that's Acts 8, 26 through 40. Sorry, jumping back to my notes. So there's a lot going on there, and there are a few things that stick out to me immediately about this passage. First thing, Philip is in tune with the Holy Spirit. The, it is clear that the Holy Spirit has come upon him and that the Spirit is prompting and leading him. And what's better is that Philip listens. In order to hear something or someone, you have to be listening. I can listen to my wife tell me to take out the trash or help with the kids or do this to help with dinner. But am I listening? Am I actually doing what she asks me to do? Am I hearing her? Am I listening? And Philip is clearly listening. Philip listens to the spirit when he embarks on the journey. Get up, go down this road. Okay, I guess that's what I'll do. And off Philip goes. Um, now, we're not really sure what the, the scriptures mean when, when it says eunuch. I think in the ESV, which is the translation I'm using, it, it mentions in there a, a court official or um, a, a royal trusted servant, a treasurer of sorts. And then there's the more traditional meaning uh, that he could have been emasculated. Either way, 
as a eunuch, he would have been barred from entering the inner courts of the temple. He would have been banned from encountering God or receiving forgiveness and, and drawing into a relationship with God. This makes the fact that he's reading Isaiah super significant. In Isaiah 56, which is not the passage he was reading here, but in Isaiah 56, another chapter, the prophet Isaiah talks about favor for eunuchs, giving them favor and blessings beyond sons or daughters, and giving them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. That shall not be cut off is a direct quote, and it's from the ESV, and I'm thinking, come on, ESV, like we could not find a better choice of words when uh, finding a scripture about a eunuch than they shall not be cut off. <sighs> Way too soon. Come on, ESV, get it together. Anyways, so he, like I said, he wasn't reading this passage, but one can see why a eunuch might be drawn to the words of Isaiah when researching and looking for prophecies regarding the Messiah. Philip heard this, listened to the spirit, and jumped into the chariot to tell the eunuch the good news about Jesus. Second thing that I find interesting about this passage is that the eunuch is coachable. He knows what he doesn't know. Can the same be said of us? Are we ready to learn from unexpected places? Are we asking questions, seeking knowledge, and trying to understand God better? The eunuch invites Philip to teach him, and Philip obliges. And to Philip's credit, he was aware of this evangelistic opportunity because he was walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Third thing that I noticed and kind of find interesting about this passage, Philip believed in a message of God that was not bound to a people or place. No one has the market cornered on Jesus. No pastor, no denomination, no country, no political party, no theologians. As Paul says in Colossians, Christ is all and is in all. So what walls are we putting up to prevent people from getting in? Who are we keeping from accessing the love of Christ? Who are we withholding good news and grace from because of their actions, their appearance, their orientation, their political views, etc.? One of my favorite authors, uh, Rachel Held Evans, uh, in her book, Searching for Sunday, uh, I was listening to it on our way to, to our Christmas gathering, and I, this quote just like hit me over the side of the head with the two by four. This quote, Philip got out of God's way. He remembered that what makes the gospel offensive is not who it keeps out, but who it lets in. Philip would have had many reasons to ignore the eunuch, to pass him by, his race, his anatomy, his orientation, etc. These were things that the religious leaders in Jerusalem would have used to keep him from God, to pass him by. Philip, after listening to the Spirit and being obedient, bypassed, bypassed the temple, bypassed religious leaders, and bypassed cultural norms of the day, and brought the good news to someone who was hungry for it. He even baptized the eunuch. When the eunuch asked, what's to keep me from being baptized? Uh, we don't get Philip's exact response, but clearly he had no problem with it. Philip didn't put up walls to keep the eunuch out. He didn't offer him a 12-week membership course, and then you can be baptized. You don't have to become a member first. Um, they didn't have a two-week conversation about the theological implications of baptism and how it should be done and to whom and what about the babies. Um, Philip was a zealous advocate for the good news and the eunuch was all in, even to the point of dying with Christ and being raised to live in his resurrection. Shouldn't we all be like that? Shouldn't we all be seeking to bring good news to people who need it? May this be the mantra of our 2021 at Restore and in the church as a whole. Restore Church, bringing good news to people who need it. And I want to leave you with a few questions here today. Who or what are you a zealous advocate for? I posted this on my Facebook the other day and I got a couple of interesting responses. Um, but I'd like for us to think on this. What do you spend your time, your energy, your thoughts, your resources on defending or advocating for? Are they kingdom building? Number two, are you listening to the spirit? How are you putting yourself in a space to hear its voice? Are you being obedient? Number three, are you coachable? Who allows you to speak? Who do you allow to speak into your life? And how do you respond? And number four, who are you keeping from Jesus? How? And why? How can you be more aware of opportunities to usher others 
into the presence of Jesus. Now, that's all I have. And I play, pray grace and peace and blessings on each of you as we start this new year. Um, if this is your first time checking out Restore, thanks for checking us out. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. God bless.